Good afternoon and happy Women's History Month. Welcome to the University of the North Texas Health Science Center's discussion of Maria Smelios, author of the newly released book, The Black Angels. We're so glad you could join us. I'm Dr. Cindy Weston, founding dean of the New College of Nursing at the Health Science Center, and I'm honored to co-host this event today, along with HSC Center for Health Policy, Institute for Health Disparities, and the National Research Mentoring Network. I had the opportunity to read Maria's compelling account of the Black nurses at New York City Seaview Hospital who helped cure and impact outcomes in tuberculosis. What struck me most is the innovation, the determination, and the compassion that these nurses demonstrated while facing immense social challenges in treating their patients. They were true trailblazers, and through HSC's nursing program, we're creating future nurse leaders and innovators who, just like the Black Angels, are passionate about saving and improving lives in their communities. Our first students will start classes this fall of 2024 with two new programs. The first is our post-licensure BSM program, our RN to BSM program for registered nurses who, have a, who want to obtain their bachelor's degree in nursing. And the second uh, we're so excited about is a Master's of Science in Nursing Practice Innovation for uh, BSM prepared registered nurses who wanna grow their careers as innovators and entrepreneurs. Both programs are awaiting approval for the so Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges, but we're anticipating that approval to come any day now and our applications are live and open and online now. We're thrilled also to be able to offer our inaugural nursing students low cost or no cost tuition through our innovative mentoring award program. And you can learn more about these programs at unthsc.edu slash nursing. Thank you again for your interest in learning about the Black Angels and I hope you find their story as inspiring as I did. I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Wari Allison, the Executive Director of HSC Center for Health Policy, and enjoy this presentation. Thank you. I'm so delighted, so delighted to introduce our speaker today, um, Maria Smelios. Maria Smelios was born and raised in New York City in 2016 while working as a developmental editor for Springer Science she learned about this extraordinary story and became determined to tell it. She holds a Master of Arts in American Literature and Religion from Boston University, where she was a loose scholar and taught in the Religion and Writing Program. Her work has appeared in The Guardian, Narratively, The Forward, Lit Hub, Writer's Digest, Dame Magazine, The Rumpus, and other publications. The Black Angels, the untold story of the nurses who helped cure tuberculosis is her first book. And I will hand over to Maria Smelios to speak. Welcome everybody. First, I'd like to thank Dean Weston, Dr. Allison, the Center for Health Policy, College of Nursing, Institute for Health Disparities and the National Research Mentoring Center for giving me the opportunity to talk about my book, the Black Angels, the untold story of the nurses who helped cure tuberculosis. Most people who are familiar with the story of Seaview know that on February 20th, 1952, the cure for tuberculosis was discovered there. But many, what many don't know is that, the, what many don't know is the story behind the story. The one about the black nurses that until some months ago existed only in the memories of their families. After working on this book for eight years, I can say, sorry, after working on this book for eight years, I can say it's a rich and layered narrative. It's full of complexities and nuances, triumphs and losses, sexism, racism, migration fights for housing, equal pay, and eating in a dining room without placards reading, quote, reserved for whites. It is a story about women who overcame unfathomable odds, who became mentors, innovators, advocates, one that would take hours to tell or a whole book. 
So now I have only about 30 minutes. And in that time, I want to introduce you to two of these nurses and give you a glimpse into their extraordinary story, into how and why they came to see you. Into how and why they came to see you. And what they faced on the wards every day for decades before tuberculosis had a cure. How they became the Black Angels. Like so many stories, theirs begins with a serendipitous moment, a twinkling in the universe where things seem to be aligning for one purpose, to bring certain people together for something world-changing. On a gray day in May 1929 in the Bronx, Arthur, a 55-year-old man, lay in his home, wasted and wheezing. His wife and 16-year-old son sat bedside, feeling the mist from a rain that blew through the open window, bringing an earthy scent and dulling the smell of disease that for years had permeated the air. The boy moved closer to his father, the man he loved most in the world, and watched as his chest rose and fell, and the distance between each rasping breath grew and grew, until finally it stopped, ending six years of torment from laryngeal tuberculosis, a, quote, monstrous form of the disease, the boy would later say. Two days later, this boy buried his father in Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx. This is Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx, in the same soil as Herman Melville, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Nellie Bly. Then he went home and tumbled into a grief so deep and vast that it would alter the course of his life. Eventually, this boy would become the man we all know, Dr. Edward Robichek. He was responsible for initiating the isoniazid trials at Seaview. As young Edward mourned his father trying to understand his loss, 12 miles away at City Hall, the Commissioner of Health, Dr. Shirley Wynn, was mired in a crisis of his own. Suddenly, inexorably, the white nurses at Seaview Hospital began quitting. One by one, they hung up their uniforms and walked out. Their reasons varied. Many of them were weary of the two of actually it's a two hour commute going and coming. So it was a five hour round trip commute from Manhattan to Staten Island. The successive days of 12 hour shifts, the chronic mental and physical toll their job demanded. But most were leaving to escape tuberculosis, the great white plague, the robber of youth, the captain of all these men of death and its victims, the quote, incurable, infected, uncultured, uncouth and indigent consumptives. That's who the city sent to Seaview, New York's largest municipal sanatorium. On its floors, hundreds of patients lay in iron frame beds, languishing, their bodies heaving with millions of arrogant microbes that gnawed at their lungs, kidneys, and tongues, their spines and bones and brains. All day long, they sweated and groaned and cried out. They coughed and choked and spit up blood, each hack sending swarms of live germs onto bedpans and sheets tables, chairs, and doorknobs. The bacteria landed on walls and nightstands and window shades. It drifted under beds and down hallways, slinking into every room and corner of the ward. It was always present, prowling, swirling, waiting to strike anyone who wasn't already sick. Over the years, the nurses had watched their colleagues fall ill. They saw how their faces turned ashen, how their eyes burned from a fever that climbed and climbed and how their skin exuded a sickly odor that no amount of washing could eradicate. Some recovered, at least temporarily. Others died in the wards where they once worked, mouthing God in heaven, or no, 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 or nothing at all. In those early days of 1929, before the great crash, the city thrummed and churned and grew, giving white working women plenty of options for jobs that wouldn't kill them. They could become sales clerks, cashiers, stenographers, secretaries, librarians, and telephone operators who could work the switchboard. This is Seaview in 1930. They could become telephone operators who could work the switchboard at the New York Telephone Company's new headquarters, a soaring Art Deco skyscraper, the exact opposite of the dark and sprawling Seaview. Since the 1900s, tuberculosis had plagued the city, finding willing hosts in the waves of immigrants who arrived from all over Europe and found lodging in the Lower East Side tenements. Sprawling across a tangle of narrow streets and alleyways where pigs and dogs and rats wandered alongside humans stood 80,000 five-story tenement buildings collectively housing 
2 million people, then two thirds of New York's population. These were dark places in dark times, havens of misery and despair, described by journalist Jacob Reese as quote, fever breeding structures. Inside them, narrow hallways lit by gas lamps led to tiny 300 square foot apartments where entire generations, sometimes 10 to 12 people, lived shoulder to shoulder with scant fresh air and no indoor plumbing. During the day, the airless space was transformed into a workplace for punishing low wage jobs. Sewing buttons, shelling pecans, rolling cigarettes and tying tags on clothing. At night, the people swept away the day's work and went to sleep head to foot, four or five to a bed or between chairs or under tables. Some grabbed a blanket and curled up in the hallway or on the rickety stairwell where mice and giant roaches skittered, upsetting the dust and droppings and cobwebs speckled with TB microbes. City officials, especially Dr. Herman Biggs, despised these buildings, but he despised the people who lived in them more. For years, he had spearheaded an effort to control the spread of tuberculosis through various measures, disease maps, registration laws, tent colonies, mass mailings, posters that shamed and stigmatized those who became sick. He even enlisted a health clown named Choo Choo, who along with his health dog sidekick, Cremo, sang ditties about bathing, drinking milk, and opening windows to children living in the slums. But everything failed and Biggs grew desperate. He implored the city to build a hospital as a quote, necessary protection for those who don't have TB, but are exposed to it by the carelessness of others. And others in this context refer to the immigrants who had come over from different parts of Europe and the African-Americans up in Harlem who were dying at three times the rate of white people from tuberculosis. The city obliged him. In 1913, Seaview opened, and within two days, it reached its original capacity of housing 800 sick people. Eventually, Seaview would be housing 1,800 people, which was well over the capacity which it had been designed to, to, um, to house. It, when it opened in 1913, as by the time it got to the mid thirties, they had added on more buildings, but still it was over 200 beds over capacity. Now at the end of the 1920s, the nurses were leaving the dream hospital and Seaview's triumph had become Commissioner Wynne's nightmare. Tuberculosis remained the third leading killer in the great metropolis and the fourth globally. Dispersing the patients throughout the other 29 municipal hospitals was impossible. If Wynne could not find nurses to staff Seaview, he would be forced to close wards and hundreds of highly contagious TB patients would converge on the city, their coughs and phlegm flinging active bacilli into the air like confetti. Infection rates would rise and decades of progress would be reversed. Not on his watch, he said, Seaview would not close. He would find some way to replace the white nurses immediately. Meetings ensued health officials and infectious disease experts anxious to solve the problem, sat together for hours and gradually an idea emerged. The city would issue a hiring call across the South, one similar to those made by recruiters who swayed black sharecroppers and farmers to leave and come North and work in slaughterhouses and steel mills and factories. Across the country, Hundreds of trained black nurses were qualified, yet un or underemployed because of segregation. The city would offer them a package, free schooling if necessary at Harlem Hospital School of Nursing, on the job training, and above all, as they saw it, a rare opportunity to work in one of the city's integrated municipal hospitals. So at the time, a lot of people don't know this, only four of New York's 29 municipal hospitals employed black nurses. The solution wasn't ideal, but a shortage was a shortage and the ongoing great migration was proving that this idea could absolutely work. The call went out. Advertisements appeared in black newspapers and on church bulletin boards. Recruiters from New York showed up at historically black colleges and soon black student nurses read about a chance for a career in New York City. Sorry, news spread by word of mouth. It moved down the Eastern seaboard across the Mason-Dixon line 
through Virginia, Tennessee, the Carolinas, and deeper and deeper into the American South. It didn't take long before the nurses began coming, packing up their lives and dreams and leaving southern cities and rural towns. Alone, they boarded those Jim Crow trains and buses and headed north. Most of them were young and eager to use their degrees, to live a life free from the daily constraints of segregation, the back doors, the yes sirs, the colored water fountains and waiting areas, the sidewalk rules, and whatever else white men had dreamt up and turned into a law. During the 1930s and 40s, hundreds of women answered this call, far too many to fit into a single book. But I'd like to introduce you to two of them in the time we have left. The call arrived in Savannah, Georgia, one sweltering day in 1929, three months into young Robichek's morning. It came to 28-year-old Edna Sutton like a reverie, a glorious invitation that reawakened her waning dream of becoming a surgeon or a nurse. Born in 1900 on the floor of a tar paper shack in one of Savannah's shanty towns, such dreams, her family said, were considered, quote, fanciful, lofty, outrageous. Black women in Savannah rarely left menial jobs in the city, let alone become surgeons. But Edna's father, an enslaved man, had inspired his daughter. In 1899, he walked off his plantation in Confederate Wilkes County, Georgia, arrived in the city of Savannah and reinvented himself, becoming a preacher. Dream big, he taught his daughter. And so after high school, Edna enrolled in one of Savannah's two black training schools for nurses, the Georgia Infirmary, a small charity hospital. It relied on student labor and donations to stay open. It was considered a godforsaken place and it strained to serve 1800 impoverished people a year a burden that fell on Edna and her fellow trainees, who assisted a small staff of overworked nurses. In addition to taking vitals, learning wound care, assisting in procedures, the nurses also mopped and cleaned bathrooms, changed linens, and laundered clothes. Despite those long hours and the difficulty of the work and lack of supplies, many times there weren't enough shrouds to bury the dead. Edna loved her job. In the words of her family, she had found her calling. But after her two years of training, the school let her go and Edna joined the hundreds of black nurses who were unemployed because the same system that drew lines around water fountains and waiting rooms and bus stations also drew them around hospitals. Black nurses were only allowed to work in black hospitals. At the time, there were only 230 versus 6,000 white hospitals. White hospitals would rather remain understaffed than hire black nurses. So Edna took a job as a clerk, spending years sorting and stapling papers and taking care of her younger sister, 20 years her junior. And then on an August day, she learned about Seaview and applied because what Edna wanted most in her life was a professional career, one that would allow her to pursue her dream of medicine and make her enough money to buy a house in a place where she didn't have to look at the signs telling her where she could sit or walk or go to school a place her younger sister would have opportunities that she could only imagine, a place she could reinvent herself. Seaview, she believed, was that place. So she went through this harrowing training period at Harlem Hospital because the charity school was not accredited and she needed more, she needed a year and a half of schooling. And then she began working as a post-operative nurse in Seaview's surgical ward. Um, what I wanna point out here is there's no overhead lights. The surgery was done by the whims of the sun coming in from that skylight. For years, she listened to patients who asked about operations with terrifying names, thoracoplasty, lobectomy, and frenetic nerve crush. And she tried to quell their anxiety about dying. Time and again, she saw how tuberculosis annihilated the body in fantastic ways, how it dug deep, it devoured the spines of children, it mashed up the brains of grown women. In an immigrant stonemason, it had pulverized his lungs, nearly liquefying them. As he lay dying, coughing up blood in clumps of mucus, it was Edna who stayed with him through the night, placing ice chips on his lips and telling him things were all right, even though they weren't. In the morning, when the sun rose above Staten Island, his body shut down and ended his torment. Nights like these were par for the course, and Edna quickly came to understand that few places were darker than Seaview, 
but until there was a better treatment for tuberculosis, this is where she was called to this island, this hospital, and these people that the city had damned. So one of the things I find most, I guess, um, moving and also frightening about this photograph is you can see that the, they had these open wards where the beds were separated by a nightstand and and the beds were all on one side and on the other. So it was a mirror image and running down the middle. If you see the woman beside this woman who's asleep and sick, this is what used to happen. So you'd have somebody who could sit up and then somebody who was grievously ill laying next to them. So there was no privacy and there was no space for people to just be sick and weep or pray or everything was done out in the open. There were many others like Edna. I'm oh, sorry, here's another photograph. Um, this was taken inside the wards of CVU sometime in the 1940s. There were others like Edna who committed themselves to caring for the sick and destitute people of New York, Clemmie Phillips, Janie Shirley, and Missouria Luvinia Meadows Walker who arrived via, via Howard University determined to put down new roots and advocate for the integration of black nurses into the American Nurses Association. And then there was Virginia Allen, who at 92 might be the last living black angel. This is Virginia Allen. She is still alive, thank goodness. Um, and she, this picture is from probably five, six years ago where we had gone to um, City Hall and they presented her with a proclamation from the city of New York for the black angels. Virginia is the niece of Edna, and she came in 1947 during a dire nurse shortage set off by the war. At a mere 16 years old with no nursing experience, she was hired as an aide in the children's hospital whose hollowed out remains now stand in a jumble of dense forest. There's another picture of her. So that's the children's hospital. Back then when its floors were filled with 250 children, many said it was the saddest place in the world a place where the disease reared itself in uglier ways, in the rows of cribs and beds, in the walkers and wheelchairs, in the children's toys that lay strewn on blankets or tossed on and under, under or around the beds. It arrived in a noise, a dissonance of sounds, crying, giggling, babbling, whining, moaning. Virginia isn't here to tell you a little bit about her experience, but some years ago, I had interviewed her for a very long time. And so now I'm happy that I can share with you a snippet of this interview where she's um, describing a, a child's iron lung. It's in, and I'm gonna use this in quotes, a museum at Seaview, which is really just a space where people have taken rooms and like try to like reconstitute what the hospital may have looked like. Um, here are the children on the, on their, on their porch, porches taking in the rest cure, which was the gold standard treatment for tuberculosis. And here they are doing heliotherapy. It was believed that the sun could cure the disease. And here's a video of Virginia. Are 25 and the children always found ways to get out, but they couldn't unlock it except that they pressed on this little button. But you know, kids climb out of, of cribs all the time. And this machine here, it's very old, is called the, um, a respirator. And the name of it just eluded me, but it'll come back, Emerson Respirator. Uh, the child would be inside here, this, this big uh, machine and it would be closed and the only ports that we had to work on the child would be through here and of course their head would be out there and they were in this machine to help them breathe. Is that the iron lung? Uh, yes, this is a child's uh, size, what they call the iron lung. It breathed for the patient. There was mechanism in here and uh, this was a port here where you could put the child in. 
that these are old machines, no longer used, but the concept hasn't changed over the years. It's just a little more fancy looking. Did you find it cumbersome to work on a child in one of those? No, because you trained how to do it. And Were they in pain? Sometimes. I had uh, excellent training here. I would say superb. The nurses who worked here were educators, even on the floors. And we had an education department in the uh, building that I live in now, the nurses' residence. On the first floor, they had several rooms that were set up like classrooms because we had a rotation of nurses who came from Owen Hospital and um, Lincoln to do their um, iso not isolation, infection control uh, rotation. So that was wonderful. I learned a lot. How long would a child stay in one of those? It could be uh, any length of time. It's according to their condition. Virginia went on to say how comforting these children was difficult. They were fussy and wheezy and irritable. Some of them threw food, toys, pillows, and then snivelled for hours, a constant low nasally whine punctuated by crackling and hacking coughs. A good handful of them fumed, their faces and necks turned red, and their fingers clenched into small fists. They shouted and thrashed and threw long-lasting tantrums. In the daily logbook, the nurses chronicled the days, quote, Anthony quite miserable, Ruth listless and helpless, Bobby, many lesions crusted over on his face, Andrew appears partially paralyzed this morning. Those daily notes, however brief, taught Virginia how a physical pain was a handmaiden to an excruciating parental ache. She goes on to talk about how some of these kids were abandoned. Um, they were abandoned because they were stigmatized. People who had tuberculosis were considered polluted and dirty. And so if you had somebody with tuberculosis in your home, the community wanted to stay away from you. They also didn't want to get sick. Um, it was a far way to go for some parents and some parents just couldn't take taking, you know, having a sick kid and trying to raise other children at home. So they left them there. In the lines between the rage of the logbook, a different story emerged. Nurses wrote about the children who missed their families, homesick, depressed, wants to leave, wants mom, cries for mom. And on went the somber evolving narrative of yearning and sorrow that no amount of singing or playing with puppets or paper dolls or cars could eradicate. But still the nurses tried. And this is where they became kind of innovative in many ways. Um, there was no cure for tuberculosis. They didn't know how to ameliorate, ameliorate the suffering. There were few medications that worked. Um, and so they tried in the best way. And most of the way, most of the time, what they did was comfort them. Um, and Virginia talks about holding a lot of these children for a long time. When women like Edna and Missouria and Clemmie and Virginia came to see you, no one told them that here people were sicker than anyone should be allowed to become sick. That here people remained for years. I looked at hundreds of medical cards. Oops. And these are from Seaview, the Seaview, actually. Um, and they tell the story, the length of stay, 465 days, 609 days. One of them read 1,019 days, over three straight years at Seaview. For the people who were there, time fell away. They grew desperate, despondent, and their voices became laced with a dark and faded bitterness. A resignation reserved only for the gravely ill, and only for places like Seaview, where life was lived in the shadow of death. Many passed the hours in macabre ways. They tracked sputum and fevers, and they used the stats to bet on who would die first. It was a strange spectacle, and for the nurses, it reinforced their role not only as medical providers, but as mediators who constantly straddled the world of the living and the world of the dying. And all the while they dealt with the institution personified by their supervisor, Miss Lorna Dune Mitchell, a Teutonic white woman, the daughter of a Confederate medic who wielded her power in perverse ways. She lurked in hallways, 
hoping to catch the nurses doing something wrong. She refused requests for transfers and prevented them from wearing masks on a regular basis. Masks, she said, quote, made them complacent. According to the nurses, Miss Mitchell had a gaze that could freeze the devil himself, they said. She said, they, the nurses said. Then there was the racist vision of some city officials that they were simply expendable, just like the patients. In response to a challenge from a fierce nurses advocate for rights, for nurses' rights in 1933, the president of hospitals revealed his true colors. This was at a meeting with over 300 people, nurses and city officials and high level hospital people. The nurse stood up and said, why do you send black nurses to Seaview? And he responded, quote, the reason we send black nurses to Seaview is because in 20 years, we won't have a colored problem in America because they'll all be dead from tuberculosis. But they didn't die. Instead, in the face of such impediments, they persisted, giving us the ending we all know, the one beginning on February 20th, when the New York Post prematurely broke the news about a cure by carrying the banner, head banner headline, TB Wonder Drug. And in a single galvanizing moment, changed the course of history. It was triumphant, and as Dr. Robichek later said, quote, none of it would have been possible without the nurses. But then nobody cared about their story, if you look closely at the most iconic photograph taken from that day, it was snapped by a man named Matt Fine. Matt Fine, excuse me. He was famous for capturing Babe Ruth's bowing out of baseball. The once incurables are front and center jitterbugging. In the back stand the black nurses. Their faces stayed and somber and hidden. They tell a different story, a more complex one. One of women who saw terrible things, who in these buildings, this is Seaview today, did the impossible, prevail over humanity's greatest scourge, tuberculosis, who followed orders from physicians who themselves were at a loss, working through trial and error and prescribing unreliable medications that often made people sicker, who stood in surgical rooms watching operations turn to butchery, ribs being sawed off in bushels of six to eight at a time, chest cavities being punctured and opened and stuffed with ping pong balls, wax packs and fat to collapse the lungs. They did it because it was their job, because they had committed themselves to saving lives at the risk of their own, but also because they were black women, subjects of Jim Crow's, Jim Crow's labor laws that offered them very few options. So now when we look at the ending depicted on the image, we know that the people who stood in the back were actually the ones on the front lines. That is the story I tell in the book the legacy of the Black Angels. A lot of people have asked me why I chose to tell this story. I just want to say first, it was a story of women, Black women who had been completely erased from history. But it was also a story about immigrants, people who were voiceless. And it's a story that resonates really loudly today. It speaks to present day issues of health inequity, systemic racism, and the way we treat people who struggle socioeconomically this is a code if, in case you, you know, to order the book, um, it'll take you right to the page. I just wanna say it's also a story about women who had to become creative, who had to be innovative in how they fought against this institutional racism every time they encountered it. They did something that was brilliant. They went to the black press. Today, that would be the equivalent of going to some social media platform and posting about some egregious situation that they encountered on a very regular basis every single day. I also, I also wanna add that these women managed to get through these difficult situations by banding together. They created communities and they kept their eye on the long game. They were able to do that, not only through supporting each other, but as Virginia says, they created this really big community of mentorship. And Virginia talks a lot about the women who mentored her because she came up at 16, her mom died at 21. And so she says all these women kind of took her under their wing and became surrogate mothers. In the end, I hope what people take away is that this is a story of triumph. It is a story that shows us there's always people, many of you in healthcare who are willing to take care of people like me, um, who rise to occasions, we saw it with COVID, when nobody else would. These women in doing so um, save tens of millions of lives by helping to cure tuberculosis and ushering in um, you know, the golden age of antibiotics. And so 
I'm happy to take questions. Um, I hope you enjoyed listening to this very, very brief overview of the book. Thank you so much, Maria. That was that was a, a great, a great, great talk. Um, I just forgot to say to everyone at the beginning um, that we're taking questions um, and doing a moderated Q&A. So um, please feel free to um, drop your questions um, into the Q&A um, and we'll we'll get them answered. Um, I guess I'll I'll start off because I don't see any questions in there um, yet. Um, I'm hoping everyone will will gather up the courage to ask ask questions. Um, I'm an infectious disease um, physician, and it it just astounds me how persistent right infectious disease stigma is. Um, you know, from the bubonic plague in the 15th century, right through to um, you know more recently leprosy, um, HIV, you know viral hepatitis, TB, and and I wonder about what it is in the human condition that that makes it persist and it and it doesn't go away. For me, in my mind, you know, I think you know, a, a cause of it is a combination of, of fear and ignorance. And for me, the antidote to that is is knowledge and information, you know, provided to 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 everyone. Um, and I just wondered what your your thoughts are on that. Um, you know, why do we see so much infectious disease related stigma and and why is has it persisted for centuries? That is a really great question. And I thought about it long and hard when I was writing this book. Um, just in the context of this book, it was an easy way to take a microbe and racialize it and layer it on top of the xenophobia that was already there for people coming in from Europe. Um, the, their different cultures were not welcome. African-Americans were not welcome in their own country. And so that microbe became a way to say, hey, let's blame all of these people instead of looking at the conditions under which they're, which they're living, right? Like tenement housing was the perfect place for the bacteria to thrive. You know, we, again, I'm gonna go back to COVID. Um, I experienced it at ground zero in New York City. Um, the people who suffered the most were the people living in the New York City Housing Authority which are sort of modern day tenements in many ways, 10 to 12, again, multi-generational people living in these homes that had windows that were maybe two windows to an apartment. They didn't open a lot of times. Um, and so it becomes a way for people to express a different type of, it, it's not a different type of racism, it's racism. It's easy. It's there. It, it's like, oh, look, you know, when COVID first happened, it became the Chinese disease, right? Immediately it went to a particular race of people. It is a way to justify xenophobia and to keep dividing a healthcare system and saying, hey, it's all of these people down here. You know, again, the book is very much about who lives and who dies based on the zip code in which you live. We saw that with COVID. So when you do that, you say, it's really easy to say, we need a healthcare system for the others who are taking care of themselves. You know, it's these people who are making us sick. And so I think it, it's not just to perpetuate the xenophobia in a, a way of like, we just don't want you coming in. It's a way to also further divide a healthcare system and justify what I say a lot of times is corporate greed, you know, to withhold medications, to say, you're not getting these medications because socioeconomically, you're not in this class of people. Um, or for example, take tuberculosis. In TB high level burden countries, um, they don't trust people to take drugs. They, you know, in, in India, in the rural villages, they'll make them come down to Mumbai for the multi-resistant tuberculosis drugs and say, we don't trust that you're going to show up and take your drugs. Like, why, why are you doing this to people? You know, why are you saying that people can't take their drugs? Um, and so it's another form of gatekeeping on every single level, you know, Thank you. We've got some questions in the chat. Um, uh, someone's asking, what was your biggest takeaway from your research and writing the book? Wow. Um, so I'll just say the nurses had no narrative. 
that was built all from oral history. So it took me years to sit down with the families and talk, like like create a, a, a narrative or cr have enough information that would create a narrative. Um, so I'll just start from there. In terms of like the question was my biggest takeaway on, on the research, was that it? On both the research and writing the book. The biggest takeaway about the research was Big that question. <laughs> um, so I just want to encourage people to listen to their family's history. Um, write down oral history. We need to preserve history. Um, there's not enough of it out there. So the biggest takeaway for me doing the research was that not only do you need to keep cross-checking, but you also need to honor the oral stories, the lived experience, and then the experience that you're going to read in the history books, because sometimes they don't jive. And both of them are valid. But listening to, you know, Virginia talk about her time at Seaview and the logbook, there is a disconnect there. She didn't experience the logbook. That might be because she was 16, but I honored her experience in the book. Um, the second thing, I forgot the other part of the question, was uh, the research and... Sorry, I think you answered it. It was what was okay. your takeaway from both oh. the research and writing the book. Okay. And I think you answered that. Okay. Um, we have a question here from Alexis Short, and she's stating, you know, how can the remarkable, it's a question, how okay. can the remarkable yet overlooked story of the back angels inform and inspire our approach today to addressing stigma and sickness in healthcare, particularly in the context of health disparities and marginalized communities? I love this question, and I can't talk enough to it. Um, this, I think if we do not start looking at history and seeing what history, it, let's take this story in infectious disease. We need to start looking at history. We need to start looking at nursing history. We need to start looking at how infectious disease um, was treated back 70, 80 years ago. We are never gonna move forward. We're making so many of the same mistakes now with COVID that had been made back, you know, what is it now, 80 or 90 years ago when this story took place. I hear from nurses all the time. They send me emails or I go to talks and they tell me I'm still experiencing this violence. There's still this systemic racism happening within hospitals. Um, hospitals, you know, cannot remain underfunded anymore. They cannot remain understaffed, which was what was happening at Seaview. These women were working 14 hour days and having patient loads of 25 to 30 people at a time. And so I think what we can learn from them is the history, how they inspire us is how they got through it. In the end, this really is a story of triumph. It's a story of people who banded together and said, we are committed to doing this work. Um, and when I asked their families, I said, these women were extraordinary. They said, no, they just went to work. And I think when we look at them, we what we need is like the humanity part of it. And I'm not taking away what they went through, but there was something so human and it might be because I know the families and so beautiful um, in, in, in their genuine desire to want to make people well. So I hope that becomes inspiring to people when they read the book. Um, another question, I don't know if you have this information, but someone is asking how many of those nurses contracted TB or, so it, it's an either or question, or how did they avoid contracting this disease? So I guess it's two questions. How many contracted TB if you know, and do you know how they, uh, how they avoided contracting this disease? I know how they avoided it. And, and that was just by very careful mitigation strategies of hand washing. They took off their clothes before they went home. They all tested positive. There is no information on how many got sick and or how many died. Um, because again, Seaview, th these records along with the patient records are just overturned in a room turning to pulp. So... Wow. I wish I could answer that. Another, the questions are coming thick and fast now. Um, here's, <laughs> another, here's another question. Um, since you've been made aware of the similarities between then and now for the issues of systemic racism, immigration issues, health disparities, just to name a few, 
do you, um, Maria mm -hmm. Smelios, do any advocacy um, and any additional awareness for these issues other than promoting the book? So at the moment, the book came out about five months ago. I'm it's it's hard for me to do any advocacy except promoting the book because at this point, literally from February first through April first, I have an event almost every day. I am involved involved though with I'm starting to get involved with the tuberculosis advocacy. Um, I've done you know uh, the global uh, sorry. Stop TV USA. I went to the high level meeting. So I'm getting more involved in the field of advocacy. Um, I'm trying that it's with when it comes to the nurses and nursing, if I could use my voice, I just wrote an article for the emancipator that talks about um, these little known stories of the professional women of the great migration. And within the article, it's advocating for nurses now to for us to fund hospitals and for them to be paid whatever they want to be paid. So I'm trying to do my best, but it's very hard at this moment. I do intend to do it though. Um, I'm just waiting for, to, for this to slow down and to, you know, find my, what I, what I really want to do for it. So I, if I could bring a voice to the platform and tell people like nurses are not being paid, they're still experiencing this. They write to me on a daily basis you know, please, please be aware of that. Um, it's the best that I could do at the moment. Um, somebody has a statement rather than a question. Okay. Um, so she just says, he or she says, no question, um, a statement. We have a long way to go, even still today, before we understand that when everyone is not taken care of, yeah. all pay the price for that on several levels. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we, saw, we saw that during COVID. It's when people are not taken care of, they die, and then children are left alone, or they become, you know, long covid you know, I know a lot of people who have long COVID, they lost their jobs. So yes, you're absolutely right about that. It is an, it is a ripple effect. It is actually, a, it's like a tsunami effect, honestly. Um, this is a question. Um, so asking, in reflecting on the legacy of the Black Angels, how can we ensure great, <laughs> this is a big question, how can we ensure greater representation and recognition of the contributions mm -hmm. made by Black healthcare professionals throughout history? Um, and what steps can we take to amplify their voices? That's a big question. <laughs> that is a That is a loaded question. What I can say is that I think that if, you know, you amplify stories like this, there are so many that I uncovered and continuing to amplify these stories within the community. Um, there are so many African-American organizations that said to me, I didn't even know this history, you know? And so if you can, if people are in communities where they can promote this and then say, you know, within the book, there's a lot of other stories that have not been told. Um, it's the it's it's literally some somebody said to me at one point. Um, she said, "This story needs to spread like gospel. It has to be word of mouth. The good thing is we the gospel can be on social media platforms too. So if people could do their best to promote it and to just keep, I, I think one of the things is it's also where you live. I experienced COVID in New York. The majority of healthcare workers were black and brown women." across the country, that wasn't the case. And so I also think, you know, these stories need to get out nationwide as well and say, people who lived in New York had a very different experience with COVID and so did healthcare workers. I mean, people at the hospital a mile from me were wearing garbage bags because they were out of PP, you know, protective equipment. The nurses were in trash bags. That That is, unbelievably egregious you know i mean it's it's unthinkable like how did this happen you know when you think of the 1940s they were building an airplane a day in the brooklyn navy yards and we couldn't create this whatever that material is for them to put on those yellow gowns and go into rooms so i think the people just need to keep talking about it and and it's very hard in an age of disinformation and misinformation when you're barraged with on every platform, you know, you have to just keep saying, I'm gonna tell you a story. And it's frustrating, you know, um, but that that's the, just talk is, is the best way I can say and, and share these stories. The stories are so important, aren't they? Yeah, um, yeah so important. Mm -hmm. um, 
a question here. Um, did any of the Black angels share with you or loved ones during their life how they cope mentally and emotionally while caring for patients? And I think, Maria, when I spoke to you um, before this, you talked about how even they kept it a secret. I, I wonder if you can answer that question. So I didn't get the opportunity to talk to any of the nurses except Virginia. Um, the rest of them had passed, but their families did tell me, for example, Missouria, when somebody died or she had a hard day, she came home and she kept it quiet and she would go into her chair, they told me, and she would open her Bible and she would want to be left alone. And the nieces, she raised her nieces and nephews. She could not have children. They sort of took care of the home. And the next day she woke up and she was fine. A lot of them coped within their faith. They went to church. They, it was a quiet reconciliation of what to do, you know, of, of how to deal with it. They did not talk about it the way people talk about it. I guess would, would people come home and say, I had a bad day. That was not on the table. They didn't do that. And part of it was they needed to remain stayed for their families and steadfast. And, you know, they were also fighting against trying to um, dismantle this system of inequity in New York City, because if they wanted to transfer hospitals, they couldn't. They had to quit. If they had 10 years of, you know, of working in one hospital, they had to quit, reapply and start at the bottom until 1940. So it wasn't even an option to complain. You know, for them, one family said, why would she complain? She couldn't change anything at the moment. And that's what I meant when they saw the long game. Um, and so they coped through faith. They coped through their, they made these, they had these nurses groups through the church. Um, and the families didn't know what they talked about. Some of the time, some of it, it was because they were children, you know, and they, they would say, you know, leave the room. Um, we have a question here about whether Seaview is set up as a, a museum now. It's not a question about if there are plans to do so. Um, this person wants to know, is it set up as, as a museum now? Um, well, that's a loaded question. The downstairs surgical ward had been a kind of museum until maybe eight or nine years ago when the person who was overseeing it left and then COVID happened and it turned into people just traipsing through a COVID testing center. And so it was pillaged and the ceiling has collapsed. So no, it's not, it's set up as a warehouse now where these, I think these items are just sort of tossed aside. The person who holds the keys is a gatekeeper. He will not let anybody in, despite the fact that it is a public museum on city property and designated as such. I mean, I struggle to get in there. The New York Times struggled to get in there. Wow. Wow. Um, so there's a question about whether socioeconomic, and I think you you spoke to this, mm -hmm. but if you could speak to it again, um, the question is about whether so socioeconomic status um, uh, allows infectious disease to proliferate um, and expand. Um, you spoke to this, but if you can speak mm -hmm. to it again. So I am not an infectious disease expert, but what I can say is what I saw during COVID. The highest rates of COVID spreading were in, in places that where people had, if you want to call it inadequate housing or where the housing, where they lived in these small apartments and they didn't have any, you know, a lot of people fled the city. The, the, the rich fled. They went out to their homes all over the place. The rest of us were stuck in close quarters. Those who lived in what's called the NYCHA housing, the New York City Housing Authority, is, is really, it's the low-income housing where it proliferated. There were a lot of deaths there. Um, I, I don't know if it's, yes, it is inadequate housing because with inadequate housing comes high levels of poverty, comes high levels of fear of going to hospitals and doctors or the inability to go, you know, the vaccine came out and everyone was like, go get vaccinated. Well, people who were had to show up to work couldn't just go and get vaccinated or people who were immunocompromised. And the Bronx, there was huge swaths where there was nowhere to go to get the vaccine. And so I think inadequate housing is just another facet of, you know, that it's not, People who live in inadequate housing also have a, a lot of other problems, and that might be they're they're 
they're disabled and they can't get disability or they can't get a job or their job is, you know, there's all these other things that feed into it. So yeah, I do think it not only spreads disease, but it does make people sick. You know, people who can't eat properly or people who don't go to doctors because they're afraid. Um, and there's a lot of mistrust in the African-American community given the history of what's happened, you know, um, with healthcare. And that segues really well into the next question. Um, uh, Terry Mote is asking, saying thanks for the presentation, mm -hmm. stating they work for the health department as a community health liaison and asking what would be your, one of the huge challenges is this trust, building mm -hmm. trust in the community. What would be your recommendation to their team, to <laughs> us all, um, on being able to reach more families and clients and build trust? So I love this question because I talk about it in the book. Edna, when she is working for the charity hospital, is also sent to the backwoods of Savannah to take care of people who consider hospitals dens of death, people who live in rural Savannah, who believe that disease is brought about by the devil and miasma. And what she tries to do when she's there is convince them to go to the hospitals if they're very sick. And she builds this trust. And and, and they trust her. And so that's part of her thing of leaving. She, when she decides to leave Savannah, she's like, well, I'm leaving all these people who started to trust me. They saw her as an ally. And it's representation. Just, you know, in, in writing this book and listening to people, you need people who can identify. You know, um, when, you know, if you're dealing with a, a, a group of people who is mired in poverty, and you send somebody who is completely like a billionaire down into their world and they're, you know, the billionaire comes dressed in, in all, you know, garland out and everything. And, and they're not going to identify with this person. They're going to laugh. They say, you have no idea what I live through every day. You know, so I think representation matters. I think approaching people on their terms, listening. This is what I like to say. I spent years just shutting up. I listened to what people said. I decentered myself. I didn't care what they said. They could talk all they wanted about like how terrible white people were. I just listened. And they felt seen and they felt heard. And by decentering yourself, you allow them that safe space and they will come to trust you. And that takes a lot of time. It took a lot of time for these families to bring me into their homes. Um, and, and I was fine with it. I was like, I, it will take all the time. And some of them didn't. Some of them decided, I don't want to talk about this. It's too painful for me or for whatever reason. And so I respected that. But I just think it's it's really listening to the community and seeing their needs and meeting their needs on their level, not your level. You know, you we go in with like particular ideas and we got to get rid of those. It's It's like a phenomenological approach where you're just like, it's, I got to see what, I'm just a witness here. So we've got to the end of our questions. There's a okay. couple of a couple of people thanking you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, I'll like to pass over to Damaris um, Javier, who'll give some closing remarks. Well, wow. Um, thank you. And thank you for such a great account on persistence, leadership, how to leveraging our leveraging cultural capita to navigate inequalities and challenges, compassion, the importance of mentorship and supporting each other, and the important work and many times unnoticed work that nurses and other health professionals undertake. And so I am Damaris Javier. I'm with the Institutes of Health Disparities and the National Research Mentoring Network at HSC. And so as you continue to explore paths or space in STEM, nursing, other health professions, research, addressing health disparities, supporting individuals in this space. I wanted to highlight the National Research Mentoring Network, which is a program for culturally responsive mentorship, networking, and professional development. And it's here to support you all, and it's free. We have a portfolio of resources, including finding a mentor to help with your career and professional goals, giving back and mentoring others. And we heard how this played out and impactful it was. Networking with over 29,000 individuals nationwide, creating supported communities of practice on different spaces, leveraging training courses, such as unconscious bias, optimizing mentoring relationship, navigating research and being prepared for any laboratory work, grantmanship, 
among many other resources. And so not only individuals can leverage all these great resources, but also institutions, organizations, programs nationwide can leverage the resources for their members. More information is being added into the chat. And so look forward to hearing from you. Please reach out or sign up to get today. And so again, thank you so much for such a great um, story, impactful um, story, and, and, and for everyone joining today. Thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you all for coming and listening to this story.